Thank you all so much for being with us today. I am Amanda Mansfield. I'm the Donor Relations Coordinator for the Virginia Western Educational Foundation. And I have the distinct privilege of welcoming you to this um, endowed chair series today, the Don G. Smith Endowed Chair. Um, today, I wanted to first make sure that you recognize that the Donald G. Smith Lecture Series is made possible by the generous supporters of the Donald G. Smith Endowed Teaching Chair and also many other donors to the foundation. These, the series is in due to their support, and we are very grateful for their ongoing gifts. Um, I'm delighted, especially personally delighted, to be able to welcome Deborah C. Mead to join us today to discuss the power of critical thinking. Debbie is the retired president and publisher of the Roanoke Times. She is a regional economic development advocate. She is a champion for many nonprofits, and she is a true leader in every respect. I know that you will enjoy hearing from her today. Thank you so much, Debbie, for being with us. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's wonderful to be here and to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, I see a former colleague of mine back there. Hello, Stephanie. And old friends, thank you all for being here on such a soggy day. Um, I first of all want to start by thanking a friend of mine, Mr. Donald Smith. Uh, Don, if you happen to be watching today from afar, uh, let me add my thanks for your support of this great program and, and your longtime support for Virginia Western, it means a lot. And Professor Barrett for planning this wonderful series and inviting me to participate. It's, it's really an honor to be with you. I know I have a hard act to follow. I've watched some of the previous programs uh, online, so um, uh, bear with me and thank you all for coming and having your lunch. Please eat, eat, eat away while we talk. Um, I want to start by telling you about my first big break, my first big break, and it was to be born to good parents. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, my father was a phone company manager, my mother um, a housewife back in the day <clears throat> when there were a lot more of those. I have one sibling, a sister, five years younger, and I was very fortunate to be born into this stable household. We were middle-class people and proud of it. My dad worked for uh, his company, one company, for 36 years, and he never missed a paycheck, as he was fond of reminding me when I was growing up. Um, it seemed pretty typical back then. I didn't fully appreciate how lucky I was to have this start in life until much, much later when I realized it was not as typical as, as I had thought. The most distinctive thing about my childhood then, because it was a happy childhood, is that we moved around a good bit. Um, as my father's career advanced with the telephone company, we moved from the seacoast, I was born in Norfolk, um, uh, through the Piedmont, we did a stint in Richmond, in the suburbs outside of Richmond, and then to far southwest Virginia, uh, where we lived in a little town in the mountains called Lebanon, Virginia. Um, those were all very different places to live and grow up. His assignments lasted, on average, five to seven years. Um, the, the telephone company then, it was part of the Bell system, if you remember, the, some of you do. The Bell system, a great monopoly in its day. Um, uh, it, uh, they, they, they believed in a system of rotating assignments, moving their management people around to teach them uh, a lot, and you still see that in many cases nowadays in larger companies, uh, but it was pretty uh, forward-thinking back then. Um, soon after I went off to college, my folks moved to Stanton up in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, growing up, I heard a lot of business discussed at the table, um, kind of over my head, of course, as a child. I was busy eating, you know, but the parents would talk about it. My mother was always very interested in what was going on at my father's work. I think if she had been born in a later at a later time, in a later era like today, she would have been a, a career woman herself. But back then, there just 
weren't that many opportunities. And her job was really to support my father in his career, especially as we moved around a lot. Uh, but looking back on that, I think the fact that we moved around, uh, moved a good bit, was formative for me. Every time you move as a child, and some of you may have done this, you start over in a new way. Um, we lived in all kinds of different places, from big cities uh, to the edge of big cities to suburbs to a tiny little mountain town of fewer than 4,000 people. They're all very different. Um, you make new friends. You have a new house, you know. You have to get used to that. You have to figure out how to fit in and make friends when you're the new kid on the block. It isn't always super easy. Uh, as a little child, I longed to settle down and have one house where we would stay. But now I look back and think that moving helped me to adapt uh, a lot better in my life and my career. Education was always stressed in my family. Neither of my parents had a college degree. My father went to night school through his company and had uh, about two, maybe a little more than two years of college. My mother did not go to college, although her family had wanted her to. Um, but there was never any question that my sister and I would go to college. Uh, academics came easily to me. Uh, my mother, although she was a housewife, was really determined that I was going to be her high achiever. Sometimes that was a little rough. She was a demanding woman, and she still is in her 80s. <laughs> if I brought home a 98 on a test, she'd say, that's very good, Debbie, but where are the other two points? You could have made 100. She knew that because she had drilled me on most of those uh, nights before the test. So as the older child of the two, I, my parents expected a lot of me. And again, though it was a little rough at times uh, to have those high expectations, I think it was better than their having uh, less of an expectation for me. Good manners were stressed and respect for others above all. School always came first in our family. My mother believed in perfect attendance unless you were dying. <laughs> and she also stressed ex extracurricular activities and sports to the degree that those were available for girls back then. Community service was modeled by both of my parents. They stressed that I too needed to choose an organization or two and do volunteer work at an early age to help those less fortunate. That's something that has carried forward and continues to enrich my life greatly to this very day. So the one subject that I had to work hard to grasp was, can you guess, math. This is my confessional to you today. I was much more drawn to words than numbers. I was a voracious reader, loved to write, loved to draw, loved art, took a lot of art lessons, uh, both in school and from neighbors and teachers in the communities where we lived. But I was really a bookworm. Um, my nose was always in a book. I did not dislike math, but I, it didn't come as naturally to me the way people who just love the numbers. I was not one of those. I did not love it. On the other hand, I loved science, especially life sciences and biology. In the ninth grade, um, I was encouraged to enter the science fair, and I took second in the regional uh, competition for the science fair. Loved it. Um, also competed on the word side in forensics, in girls' extemporaneous speaking. Um, as a high school student, I restarted the school paper. I found out they'd had a paper. It had gone under. It was left in debt. I encouraged, I, I persuaded a teacher to sponsor us because we had to have that. Found out the old newspaper staff left a debt of $60, and the principal said, you can start the new paper, but you've got to pay that $60 off first. And that was a lot of money back in, you know, 1972. So we just upped our first ad budget, and instead of selling you know, $200 in ads, we told, sold $260 and got the paper started. Um, I was its editor-in-chief because nobody else wanted that job. Uh, I said later on it was great preparation. Little did I know it was the first time I would uh, be facing a deficit in the revenue budget in a newspaper <laughs> and have to achieve it or go under. <clears throat> so I was an honor student, but in math I was more of a B student, B plus student, rather than an A student. Algebra was at first a struggle. I mean, I was doing fine with arithmetic, and then this algebra thing came along. Very abstract. 
And um, I have to say, I don't usually blame the teachers because I became a teacher in my first job out of college, but I really had a weak math teacher for algebra. And so many of us uh, kids struggled, um, went on to geometry, loved it, made sense, especially proofs, because you know, you're proving a theorem with you have the theory, you use logic, you come to a conclusion, really made sense. Uh, got ready to go into Algebra 2, and the geometry teacher said, many of you ha who had a certain teacher who will not be named ought to think about auditing my Algebra 1 class this summer, in summer school, so that you get a better background going into Algebra 2. Now, mind you, I'd made a you know, B plus in geometry or A minus, something like that. And I came home and told my mother about that. Guess who was the only kid sitting in summer school all summer <laughs> auditing? When we introduced ourselves, everybody in the class said uh, they were from all the high schools in the county, all came together for summer school. We went around and the teacher asked us to talk about why we were there. And most of those kids had flunked math. And of course, I, little Miss Perky, was like, well, I'm here because I didn't really do that well in Algebra 1. And my mom really wants me to have that background, that foundation for college. And I'm thinking, oh, it's a miracle they didn't beat me up. Uh, but they were very nice. They were very nice kids. And I audited that class, and it really was a help. So, you know, the, the moral of that story is don't be ashamed to go back and get remedial help. Get the background so that you have a good foundation. Because, of course, in mathematics, you're always building on that initial foundation as you go forward into higher math. Uh, I did fine in Algebra 2. It really started to make more sense to me after, you know, rehearsing it a bit and doing the remedial stuff. And then I took math analysis and trig. It was challenging. It made sense. And I'm just one of those weird people who I enjoy higher math more than arithmetic. Um, I see math everywhere. It's like English. It's a foundational degree. That means it's fundamental to everything we do. Uh, in college, uh, I was an English major. Um, my first uh, term in college, the professor anticipated the coming of computers, the computer age. Now, again, I graduated high school in 1973, so this was early on, well before, you know, Steve Jobs came along and, and changed everything. Um, he had us programming in, in Math 1, basic Math 101, um, we learned COBOL and we learned FORTRAN. Those were, you know, mainframe kind of languages. And we had to write, I know, remember one assignment was write a program for a soft drink vending machine. Because after all, a vending machine is a type of a computer. So people were starting to see the future then. Then, you know, a real glutton for punishment, I took calculus at Virginia Tech in my sophomore year. Um, my advisor at the time said, okay, if that's what you want to do. He signed off on it. I got a new advisor the next term, and she looked at that, and she said, the one thing I don't understand, Debbie, is why you're in calculus. She said, don't you know that English majors are supposed to take bonehead math? That's what they called it. I said, no, I really enjoyed it. I wanted the challenge. I was really proud of that B+. I was in a class with mostly engineering majors. Um, so there again, when, you, when you're planning your college coursework, you have to think about your GPA, of course, and of course mine would have been higher probably if I had taken bonehead math, um, but I don't think I would have been better off. You have to think about your GPA, but not solely, or you'll pass up the opportunity to challenge yourself and explore new subjects and, and really broaden yourself, which after all is the reason we're, we're in school to begin with. Uh, in graduate school, um, statistics, tough class, especially since I had had a pretty long gap between undergrad and graduate class of something like 17 years. Well, I got to class. Um, the graduate um, teacher was from Virginia Tech. Um, I thought, oh my goodness, what am I doing? Long formulas, sometimes three or four typed lines on a page, um, complex equations, whole new language, new terminology, the mode, the mean. I was totally lost the first two classes, and I'm thinking, oh, gosh, this is going to really be rough. You know, in graduate school, um, you're supposed to make an A, and if you make a B, it's kind of you're on sort of, you know, provisional status. A C is like almost like an F. 
Um, so I was really starting to worry. Then the third class, something just miraculously clicked. It started making sense. And STATS was one of the most useful courses that I had um, that paid off later in my career. It was very important, especially when we got into marketing and understanding, surveying, and so forth. It was really, really an important course to have and very, very useful. So back to undergrad. I majored in English. I took journalism courses. I worked on the college newspaper at Virginia Tech. Uh, my first job after graduation was to teach high school English, speech, and journalism, sponsor the newspaper, taught at two different high schools, two years each. I got into the newspaper business purely by accident. And one of the things that I think you've heard through many of these talks, if you've been to the ones before, this one too, is sometimes you have a happy accident that sort of sends you in a different career direction. When my daughter was just 18 months old, I rather suddenly needed to leave uh, my unhappy marriage. And I went back home to mama and daddy with a baby in tow, a toddler. And three days later, I found a job as a reporter at a small newspaper, the Stanton Daily News Leader. And two years after that, on the advice of my old journalism professor, I applied and was hired by the Roanoke Times as a reporter, starting off in their New River Valley Bureau up in Christiansburg. After I'd been there just a few months, my immediate supervisors encouraged me to apply for the job of the assistant bureau chief, which had just opened up. I felt it was way too soon. <clears throat> Plus, I loved being a reporter. I really had, you know, found my thing. But I listened to my bosses, and I applied anyway at their urging, and I did not get that job. Someone else got it who was much more qualified, had 10 years of experience, was a beautiful, award-winning writer, and I could definitely see why they gave the job to him. Um, but I took my father's very good advice. He said, call that person up and tell him congratulations, and you have to really mean it. And just remember, no one gets where you go alone. We all give our support to others, and we are all supported by others. So I followed his good advice, and less than six months later, when their first choice turned out not to be a good fit in that job, they turned to me. They didn't post the position. They, they gave the job to me. So that was a bit of a break, too, because it allowed me to show what I could do in running the daily side of the, of the New River Valley report. My biggest career break, though, came about three years later when the publisher of the newspaper sought me out to become his assistant. It was a developmental position that we had in place then. He told me it would last three years at the most. It would be an opportunity to go and learn the business side of the paper, which I had never thought about and never would have sought for myself. In fact, I had to be talked into doing it because I love what I was doing so much. But this began for me a series of rotational assignments within the company. They were real jobs with profit and loss responsibility. That means budgetary you know, responsibility. And over time, they would increase in scope and degree of responsibility. Basically, what happened is I went wherever the company had a need for a manager, either right then or would need one down the future with that background. So how did I use math in my daily work? Well, as a reporter, election night was always math heavy. Um, I remember one time on the news desk, I was covering five races, four of them local, and then my job was going to be to summarize the presidential results to talk about how our area had voted in the presidential election back then. Um, we had people called editorial assistants uh, who fed us the results. They were out in the field. They were out where the votes were being counted, and they would phone them in to us on the telephone. Doesn't that sound quaint. Uh, now you can get it from home on your laptop or your phone. Uh, but we did our own math computations. And let me just say that it is surprising how many very smart reporters cannot calculate percentages. <laughs> this is a big deal because accuracy in our business is the number one job requirement. In fact, when I got hired by their own paper, the ed editor I was going to report to sat me down and he said, the one thing around here that will get you fired, it's being inaccurate. So you got to be fast and you got to be right. Um, 
So it, it, many times after election night, we had to run corrections because the, the uh, calculations were not done properly, and that was always a bad thing to have that done. As an editor, of course, my job was often to check the numbers in stories, and also to begin to manage expense budgets. The newsroom is an expense site. It is a cost center. Um, so you have personnel costs and operational costs for supplies and so forth, and you manage those. Not revenue, not money coming in, but expense side. So it's a good way to ease into that kind of budgeting and planning. And as a beginning supervisor, you do a lot of scheduling and you have to calculate overtime and make sure that that's all in check and in keeping with the law. Um, my first job outside the newsroom, I really had three main responsibilities. I was working directly for the head of the company, the president and publisher then. Uh, one was to lead the company's first market research study. I was going to be the point person for the person doing the study, gather all the information, synthesize it, and send it off and work with her. She was um, in Boston. And then we led the implementation of the findings. Um, I oversaw a $750,000 remodeling and construction project. I had to develop the capital budget request for that. I oversaw the architects and engineering of it and the contractor. And I wore a hard hat and I learned a lot about asbestos abatement and removal, <laughs> including shutting the place down once because every time they went in there they came back out and told me we had to spend $20,000 more. So you can see where the numbers thing really started to matter. Um, and I developed and led uh, and taught a series of leadership courses to help develop our managers. That was drawing on the previous teaching responsibilities that I'd had. So I'm going to say that a little thread that's going to run through today is that everything you do, every experience you have in life, personal, professional, adds up to something that you'll do later and comes in really handy, that little nugget, long after you may think, oh, that was in my past. Sometimes you, you draw upon it because it's still there. Um, I served as the circulation marketing manager. Um, when we were shutting down our afternoon edition, my job was to um, close down the afternoon edition of the paper, convert the, the 10,000 remaining afternoon subscribers who were the diehards. They still wanted the afternoon paper long after some 90,000 others had fled and convert them to morning uh, subscribers without any losses. That was an interesting assignment. and, and fun and luckily had some great people working with me on it to pull it off. Then I went to HR, Human Resources. I did not want to go, but my publisher said, you really have to help me out, Deb, and go there. Um, I said I didn't want to be the top cop and the regulatory person and the hand slapper in the company. He said, well, you'll do some of that, but we're going to become a learning organization. We've got to get this place ready for the future, and you're going to lead that for me. Um, and that was a great place to learn the whole organization and how important it is to understand the people side of the business. It's amazing how many people get promoted without really understanding how to work with people and the problems that come up and the challenges of people management. Um, after that, I did a stint uh, in uh, advertising and eventually became the circulation director and then the ad director. The ad director is probably the job, the toughest job I've ever had, and that includes the top job, which, I, which came later. As ad director, you are responsible for the money that has to come in. It's like being the advancement person at the college. Um, no money, no mission, so you have to have that. Um, the ad director then had a team of about 100 employees, salespeople. Um, it was people management and just about all numbers. Everything that wasn't people management was numbers. Um, there was a revenue responsibility then of about $40 million. There is no pressure, as someone once told me, like that. There is no pressure like revenue pressure, knowing that quite literally every man and woman's job at the place depends on your shoulders and those of your team. But the buck stopped with me as the ad director. It's all about problem solving and Brother, tell me, there were problems from morning to late at night, all day. Problems, challenges thrown your way. 
what you thought you might be working on that day usually wasn't what you ended up working on that day. Things would surface during the day. You had to adapt, change, and find the right people around you to help you solve problems uh, in the best way. It was also a challenge to keep people motivated. You know, think about hard-hitting salespeople. They go a mile a minute. They are a different breed of cat. And you have to keep them motivated because they face so much rejection. You know, they get turned down a lot. Um, and they can be sensitive about that. And so you're trying to keep people positive even when you're trying to turn the situation around. We were experiencing high turnover before I went into that department. Um, people had lost confidence in themselves. Um, we were behind budget. Uh, it was only a couple of months into the year, and the budget was off by some 12 percent. And uh, to try to get, get people geared up and staying positive, facing those kind of numbers and saying, it's going to come. We just got to do the thing right. Do it right, and it will come. Um, you know, in advertising, it's often that you um, lose a big account. And this is true in any sales job. You lose a big account, and other businesses that you depend on as your clients are having, having spending cuts and you have to figure out where you're going to go for the money that you have put in your budget and agreed that you would, you would make. Um, we had to make a lot of business proposals, some of them lengthy and involved others on one sheet to try to explain against the competition why you should spend your dollars with us um, instead of with our competitors. And then, of course, we were drawing up business plans for profitable new business lines, that, things that we could sell because you're always trying to Im improve your uh, product lines and give, give good salespeople something new to take out, something new and exciting that will work well to talk about. As you move up the line, as I moved up the line in, into higher management, the job was much more about planning. Management work really is planning. So if you don't like to plan, Probably management is not going to be for you. And problem solving. It's about getting the work done through others. You just cannot do it all yourself, nor should you try, because that would limit your capacity. The whole idea is to pull together a great team around you and share the work. Be a leader, but more of a facilitator, so that you have the skills around you to really have more capacity in the organization beyond what one or two people could do by themselves. We used Excel almost all day long, spreadsheets. I was very fortunate when I got the top job at the paper, the president and publisher's job, which I had for a little more than six years, to have a great right-hand person as the CFO of the company, a person who could lead uh, all our analysis, our forecasting, and our business planning. Now, I have to say, I would not have wanted to do the job without having had the ad director's job first. I know that seems a little crazy. Um, yes, I loved my time in the newsroom, and I must confess, I often felt a little twinge of regret as I was doing all these tours of duty around the business in different places, unfamiliar places. I was a little, little bit regretful that my, my path had led me outside news. But I never would have been named the publisher if I hadn't had the opportunity to lead the ad department. That is the job that taught me the most. It was high pressure every single day. Um, I used to say that on a given day, um, on, you know, depending on what time of day it was, um, I was either talking somebody off the ledge or putting them up on the ledge. <laughs> and I think you might be able to imagine what I mean. You had people you needed to calm down and keep them calm and focused. You had other people you had to put the jumper cables on and say, come on, Jim, I got to have more, you know. And sometimes that was back to back. Sometimes it might be the same person on a different day. Um, it's so important to understand in any business where the revenue comes from. And that was invaluable to me uh, because little did I know, right as I stepped into the top person's job, succeeding the person who had given me that opportunity, um, the economy started into a swoon. It went into a nosedive. Um, I went into the job in early 2007. By the fall of 2008, the stock market had crashed. Lehman Brothers was gone, and our numbers were starting to just go down, down, down. It was the worst recession since the Great Depression, as, as you know. Now, I'll digress just here to say the biggest problem that 
newspapers of all sizes face today is a decline in their revenues. We've all heard of disruptive technologies, right? You're familiar with what these disruptors are. And they're things that come along and just decide they usually start small, but someday they just sort of change your business direction and it, and it never quite comes back the same way. One of the biggest disruptors, of course, is the Internet. It's one that has affected the media business, certainly uh, the most of any disruptors. Technology, too, has been a disruptor, but that kind of goes hand in hand with the Internet. Newspapers, historically, have very high fixed costs. That means, you know, you can only cut them so much. The two biggest costs of running a newspaper, a traditional newspaper, are paper and people. And those fixed costs um, of the business, including having to own a multi-million dollar press, the press down on at 201 Campbell and Salem Avenues down there, cost was about a $34 million five-year project in the making when it was put in. And um, that used to be a barrier to entry because people would get angry at you and say, I'm going to start my own newspaper. I don't like that newspaper that you're, you know, that fish wrapper you're putting out there, Debbie Mead, so I'm going to go start my own. And we'd be like, you go for it. You've got the 35 mil to buy a printing press. Well, how many people really have 35 mil lying around for one of these big behemoths that's six stories tall and needs a building, a specialized building to house it in? Well, with the Internet, look at how many online sources there are of news, content of various types, edu uh, education, entertainment. They've all sprung up. And yes, they vary in quality. But you have hundreds of choices with immediacy right in the palm of your hand. So newspapers have had to reduce their costs severely, painfully, as they've attempted to lower their fixed costs. But it's really hard to cut your way to prosperity. Meanwhile, you see, the ad revenues have plummeted as more marketing dollars continue to migrate to the web. So I was very, very lucky um, when I walked into the job to have a very talented executive team and to be able to hand pick my team for the most part, including a terrific CFO and treasurer of the company beside me. She was my right hand for strategic planning and really a business manager. Her background, CPA, MBA. Um, it was her ability to simplify complex information though and explain it to non-financial people like me. Um, very, very critical to have. She was not merely a back shop accountant, but a real business leader a, and just, just a perfect person to have in that job. And she helped all our department heads in running the company as well as helped me. The newspaper business is an even tougher business these days. Um, against the current background, the importance of <laughs> critical thinking skills, um, logical reasoning, quantitative reasoning, problem solving is, is even more dramatic. So it's real important that you have this background and that you see the, see the importance of having math and underpinning. Because you can have a person like I had, Tanya, I'll tell you her first name, and she was fantastic, and she could draw up a pivot table, you know, that would just, you know, cause your heart to pity pat. But you can't just give that over and say, well, I don't need to know anything about this. I'll just take someone's word for it. Because, of course, you have to um, be able to have an instinct for looking at those numbers yourself and seeing, does that make sense? Um, you have people who can help you analyze it, who don't just count the beans, but they tell you what the patterns in the beans mean. Um, if you just collect data and can't analyze it correctly, logically, critically, then it's just meaningless. It's just raw numbers. It's raw. With, uh, but, but how can you, you know, you, you also don't want to be so over-reliant on people who understand that, that, you know, that could be a problem for you, too. For one thing, sometimes people are untrustworthy. I was lucky that my people were very trustworthy. But what if you had somebody who had his or her own agenda and they could just sort of buffalo you if you're, you don't know what you're looking at. You're not really understanding it. 
And then sometimes, as we also know, that you can have over-reliance on data, even though, trust me, the days are long gone when the top person can, when, when a business can just be run by the top person running on his or her gut instinct. Today's businesses must run on data. And organizations do exist to make decisions, and the goal is to make good decisions fast, right? But over-reliance on data, I have to caution you, can lead you astray because the data can be wrong or the analysis flawed or biased or lead you to the wrong conclusions. This is why you have to be able to think critically for yourself and understand how the data was gathered and analyzed. And that gives you a more objective basis for, for uh, evaluating it. You also have to evaluate, be able to evaluate your employee's competence. Advice is only as good as its source. So, you know, you go by that old adage, trust but verify, and you can't remove yourself too far from where the work is actually being done. And, of course, just as important as having good numbers, good data, good analysis uh, to start out with, it's just as important to be able to course correct once your theory has been tested. It's the real experience that counts. Um, so many p people just kind of, they just say, well, we had the right plan, so we're going to just stick to this plan no matter what. Well, no, really. A plan is just a theory, isn't it? Until you put it in place and start to gather real life experience, and they're invariably something that doesn't go the way it was, you know, you thought. Now, that's when it really gets interesting, because that's when you really have to start uh, problem solving. And, <clears throat> you know, as I've told you, I think, or at least you've been able to tell through my remarks, I've had a most unusual career in my business, starting as a teacher and working as a reporter and then moving all the way up through the business side to the top job at my company. But I can't imagine a better preparation for the job, even though there were some things that came our way that were certainly still all out of the blue. Every day is an exercise in problem solving. I mean, time you walk in the door, usually around 8.30, to the time you go home, say, around 7.30. Unless you have a night event, an evening event, which in my world was most of the time, you don't turn that business sense off when you go home. You're often thinking about issues at night. You're planning. Ideas come to you. You jot them down. Um, you're trying to get a jump start on the next day or the next week or even the next year. You do long-term planning. You do short-term planning, course correcting adjusting to what's going on in the news business. By the nature of the news business, there's always something new happening. Yes, you have to react very quickly and well, but you can't just be in react mode. At the same time, you have to be planning. It's a challenge, but it's very, very exciting. It's a real adrenaline kind of business, particularly when you add in all the business components to it. So now I'm going to turn to giving you a little bit of advice, if you'll let me. Your job is not just a way to make a living, to make income. It's part of your identity. It gives you a purpose, a real sense of self-worth. It's, for many of us, a reason you get up in the morning. It's where you spend your days. It's, it's important to have a place that you feel like you know you need to go, that you're part of society. It's where you make friends and develop some of your wonderful uh, colleagues uh, do work together. There's a real bonding experience, as many of you know, from being in a tough class together or doing a great job together. I just love the variety that I had in the news business, the important role it, f it fills in a free society. Newspapers are a pillar of a democracy. We all depend on the watchdog role of journalists. Most in-depth journalism is done by newspapers, and most of what you may read online, on Facebook, when people say, well, I get my news. I don't need a newspaper. I don't need a, new, a, a real media. I just look online. Well, most of that work is taken from the great newspapers who are still out there doing that work. Um, the New York Times, most especially, and the Washington Post, and a handful of others, including some smaller papers who are still doing investigative journalism. As for the smaller papers and the medium-sized ones, I have concerns. I see them pulling back from the enterprising local content that is their true competitive advantage. There's a real art for trimming your sales when business is not going as well, but without diminishing your quality.
but you cannot rely on giving your customers less and charging them more and expect not to reach a tipping point beyond which I don't really care to imagine. What I do know is that if we value quality journalism, it's, it's important for us, it's incumbent on us as individuals to support it. <clears throat> so my advice is, as you're thinking about which career to pursue, and I don't know, how many of you know, raise your hand if you know absolutely what kind of a job you want to get after, after college? Not very many, one or two. Some people are born knowing, and my sister wanted to be a nurse from the time she was uh, five years old, and she did become a nurse with a business degree. But, you know, the rest of us are just sometimes kind of stumbling along, and it, our path may find us. But my advice is to think about finding something you enjoy, something bigger than yourself, and commit to learning that. Notice I say commit to learning. Work hard. You cannot control how much native intelligence you were born with or how much natural talent you may have. But you do always have control over how hard you apply yourself. And you have control over, you know, your willingness and your commitment. Um, that idea of seeing what needs to be done and just do it. And you can dedicate yourself at this early stage to really being a learner. And realize that you never really make it in life, not even when you get the top job. Um, you have to keep learning. You have to stay open to change. How many times when I had the top job at the local paper, people would say, well, why'd you have to work late? You're the top person there. You can just walk out the door. Nobody there's going to tell you, you know, you can't take the afternoon off. And I'm thinking, think about that. You know, I have to set the example. And I love being there, you know. It wasn't a question of how, how little can I put in and fool people that I'm doing the job. Um, there's always something that, that you can find to do. And if you have a dull moment in the news business, well, just wait, it'll pass because it's just a little lull, so rest up because something big is probably coming right behind it. But over the course of your life and your career, you're going to have to stay open to change and you must keep learning. You'll likely need to be mobile. It's very rare anymore for anyone to spend 30 years in one company the way I did, all of it, at one place in one city. I had different assignments in that business, but I didn't have to physically move or change careers once I had found journalism. You're likely to have many jobs, many different projects, many different assignments. Each one will prepare you for something that's to come. Your path likely will not be straight up, but it will be a zigzag. Um, they like to say this, uh, a, not a ladder straight up in, like in the olden days of yore, but maybe sideways like a lattice where you're climbing and then going sideways. You'll have setbacks. The way you respond to those setbacks will say a lot about you and will determine your success. Mistakes, um, stumbles can be an excellent teacher if you learn from them and apply the learning going forward. STEM careers offer such a wide variety of exciting opportunities. Um, if, if I had to give someone career advice, and I do from time to time do that, um, I would say look at STEM. Um, look, how, look how broadly um, the STEM career, the, the whole span of careers that fall up under STEM or STEM age. Healthcare, technology, engineering, if you're good at math, these are really growing areas that are going to have a long lifespan. Um, we have a top engineering school so close to us here at Virginia Tech. We have the College of Health Sciences uh, here in Roanoke. We have one of the best public universities in the nation at UVA. Over at Hollins, where I happen to be on the board now, English is the most popular major. It's a liberal arts, small liberal arts school, but science and math are right behind. As I look to the future then, I see so much happening right now that we're right on the cusp of that's so exciting and would be wonderful to be a part of if I were starting over. You know, I always say I don't want to go all the way back. I'd like to have maybe 20, 25 more years now. I, I don't really want to go back to the terrible teens, you know, acne and all that stuff. My 20s were really my kind of, you know, tough little decade. But oh, 25, 30 more years to see all this come about, that'd be cool. Um, Self-driving cars, they're working on them right up at Virginia Tech. I heard a presentation about it just uh, about a month ago. 
um, advances in medical research, such as immunotherapy to cure types of cancer and other dread diseases. I just read an article the other day, I was on an airplane, and I read an article about this development, this idea of short-range regional aircraft powered solely by electricity. It would be like shuttles, and you just jump on them for flights of, you know, that usually take an hour or two. And since I was going through a hub and it was a long, drawn-out process, I was thinking, wow, I can't wait for that to come. Think how this will revolutionize travel. So be thinking as you assess your career and your career choices now, how will I get ahead of the curve, regardless of what field you choose? How will I get ahead of the curve and stay ahead of it through the course of my career? You're taking that first step by being in college and choosing a field, experimenting with different kinds of classes. Um, you're, you're sort of developing a style there and, and choosing a field that you enjoy and you believe will lead to a rewarding career over time. And staying ahead of the curve, the ones that we know are coming, and the surprises that are going to pop up that we don't know about yet along the way, will call on you to keep building on that foundation and keep that edge. Now, a few things that I look for when I'm hiring. Now, I have to tell you, since I've been retired, about three years or so, interestingly, the past three hires I've participated in making are these. The head of this region's largest nonprofit, United Way. I was the board chair when one day at lunch, the outgoing um, CEO dropped the bomb. As, oh, by the way, I'm leaving. I'm resigning. <laughs> I thought my term was going to sail to a nice conclusion. And suddenly, I'm leading a search for a chief executive. Luckily, we found a great one in Afira DeVries, uh, first woman and first person of color to lead our United Way. I participated uh, in the hiring of the new uh, Roanoke City police chief. Very important job, given all that's going on in our communities around the country in police work and community policing here. Um, very interesting uh, panel to be on. And I participated somewhat, nominally, uh, in, in uh, bringing in the new president of a small <coughs> private college where I'm on the board, Hollins. All of this came about in conjunction with my community service, and they were all very, very interesting uh, executive-level jobs. Here's what I always look for, and it's amazing how this resembles what I looked for when I was back at the newspaper, be it in the newsroom or in other areas. Curiosity. Intelligence a track record of achievement. I look for how coachable is he or she. Now, coachable is really important. Is the person the type who's an eager learner and will just soak up new learning like a sponge? Um, because that's a person who has more potential to grow. You always want to hire somebody, I think, who has potential to grow and go beyond the job because who knows, tomorrow the job is going to be different than it is today. Someone who has a collaborative spirit. Someone once said, everybody who interviews is a team player. Nobody ever says, I hate teams. I hate working with people. I'm going to be the most disagreeable teammate. No, everybody's a team player when they interview. But sometimes when you hire people, you find out they really don't want to share decision-making qualities with others. But if you are collaborative, that will come through. Um, someone who asks good questions. Now, here's my advice. Always have a few good questions to ask um, because you will be given, most likely, a chance to ask those. And it's always disappointing when I'm listening for this as the interviewer to have someone say, no, nope, I think you've covered it all. <laughs> really? We've only talked about 10 minutes usually. Um, and it shouldn't be about how much vacation time will you get or where will your desk exactly be. Those are bad signs, you know. <laughs> um, that kind of brings me to this. Know who you're talking to. If you're talking to the benefits manager, then it's perfectly fine to ask about what, are, what is the salary, the pay, the benefits, the health insurance. All those are very important things about the job, of course. But if you're talking to the head of the company, asking where your desk will be in three buildings away and down three flights of stairs, I don't know. And wherever it is now, it probably won't be there in another few weeks. So, you know, that makes you appear, well, you know, rigid and that you don't really know. But 
if you know who you're going to be talking to, you can prepare some questions that show that you actually understand a bit about this person's job. And if you have a few minutes with the person in that job, how do you want to spend it? Again, it's a chance to, to show your, uh, convey that you are um, on, on top of it. You want to convey that you're competent. You want to show some initiative if you've done a little homework. If you see something that needs doing, do you do it? Um, if you have done community service, highlight that. It rounds you out and provides outside experience. Good companies tend to want people to have had some community involvement. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a quick story about a young man. I was in running a, when I was in the circulation marketing department, the number two job in that department back when. Uh, one of the duties was to run a telemarketing department, selling the newspaper. And um, these were part-time people, very part-time people. They worked nights, the understanding they had other jobs. They wouldn't be in the jobs forever, right? It was kind of a fill-in part-time job while they were in school or working elsewhere. And on this young man's uh, first night on that job, we were in the midst of orientation. Someone ran in. We were the only people in that part of the building at that hour of night. And uh, I was there because I was training and looking after the new hires. And someone ran in the building with his eyes, you know, this big and said, Debbie, there's a flood, there's a pipe that's broken, and water's coming down the hall. And suddenly, whoo, she didn't have to tell us there was about a foot of water in the hallway. I went out in the hall, and it was just running loose. Some kind of a big water pipe had broken in one of the upstairs bathrooms, and it was flooding our hall. And I went to find somebody in the maintenance department who could help with that. You know, that it was that or swim, you know break out the boats. And I went to find this person. And when I came back, this young man named Brian, just a kid, college kid, at Virginia Western, I might add, at the time, had grabbed a mop out of the broom closet. I mean, he had taken off the headset, and he was trying to stanch the flow. Now, he wasn't getting very far, but that was so impressive, you know, that he actually, I said, where'd you find that? And he's like, oh, I just started opening doors till I, found, I figured there had to be a broom closet around here. And he was using that mop to try to, like, mop up some of the, and he stayed on after they cut the flooding off, and he was doing all of that. Now, you know, that was an example, but if you think about it, that's been, you know, 20 years ago, and I still remember it. Um, no one told him to do that. He just jumped up, and he was the only one who did. Um, most jobs will require you to work with people, as well as with numbers or technical details. And another thing to think about is you have to be prepared to be a professional, to manage yourself and your outside life and not let it interfere too much in your work. Um, the people who work for me would tell you, Debbie's not too keen on drama. Um, and it's a fair, it's a fair assessment. Um, that doesn't mean we're not people. We all deal with things in our outside life. Trust me, I was a single mother for a long time, and um, I know what it's like to have a sick child on the eve of some big thing going on at work, and it's, it's really challenging. But try to stay out of office politics to the degree you can. Don't let yourself be drawn in. You're, you're looking for opportunities to serve and show what you can do. Now, when you interview, you're also trying on the employer for size. Sometimes it feels like it's always about them. But think longer term. Part of a, lar you're, you know, part of a larger organization um, is that you'll have more bureaucracy, more red tape perhaps, but perhaps more opportunities. The world seems to be going toward bigger corporations, gobbling up smaller ones. Um, there can be opportunity in that. Not just salary, but benefits also count. Uh, one big benefit is training. So look for a company. Uh, to start out that invests in its people. Uh, when there's high turnover, that's definitely a red flag. Why are people fleeing? Um, again, you want to try to pick a field that is expanding, not contracting. Your marketability is something you carry with you. And as my old journalism professor told me in recommending I get out of my small newspaper and go to a bigger place at that stage in my life, you need to go where they can teach you something. So internships, summer, holiday jobs, great way to gain experience, show that you know how to work. Um, remember that everything you do is preparation, and you're always working for a reference. Ideally, everybody you've ever worked for, when they hear your name, they ought to be able to say, oh, 
Catherine, she's fantastic. Hire her, you know, right away. Um, you don't want to burn bridges, right? You never know when those people may uh, come around again or you may need to count on them for something. It's how you build a network. It's not just schmoozing, sucking up, brown nosing, whatever you call it. But through working together, showing what you can do, you build that network that's going to serve you well all your life. Now, I'm going to stop talking and be happy to take your questions. I know you have some good ones, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Now, what would you like to know? What can I answer in the time we have left? Mm, I saw you first. Yes. Uh, how much different jobs would you have to do? Like a lot of uh, people management, I would think. Yes, a whole lot of people management. I mean, um, people are organic creatures. You know, we don't just fit in a little box. And there's always something. And, you know, that someone once told me, you hire a person. So whatever is going on with that person in their life or that day, that's what you have. You can't separate that. You can't divorce that. from. So you have to remember that people bring all that with them to work. And some people are better at kind of keeping that down in the background. Um, and um, it's also a very enjoyable part of the job. Now, some people just aren't cut out to be managers. Um, I know people who are top-notch salespeople. And they would tell you right up front, I don't want to manage other salespeople. I want to be on my own. I can make more money. Uh, I want to be out selling. But they're working with people in a different context. They're uh, working with clients. And they really want to be just responsible for themselves. But um, I got into management kind of, I, I didn't, it wasn't like I set out to be a manager. I didn't have that many great examples early on of terrific managers. Um, and so I didn't really know what they looked like. Um, I was coaxed into management, and the reason I was willing to do it was because um, I felt like if I didn't play a part in making the decisions, I was just going to be sort of the recipient of those decisions. So I kind of thought that if I, if I thought I could weigh in and make the work better, I was willing to go for it. And that's usually, that's a good way to do it. Not to go into it because you want to exert power you're on a power trip, or you think you have all the answers. Those people make bad managers. Um, but yeah, it's people wherever you go. It really is. And an understanding of um, human resources and how the organizations tick, very important. I'm often called on in nonprofits to sort of be a de facto HR consultant, because so many people will say, I never had any HR, and it sure would be handy. HR might not be the place you want to stay, but it's a great place for a stint, and I'm lucky that my superiors sent me there so I could learn a lot about it. Good question. Thank you. Yes? You mentioned earlier, newspapers and then the advent of radio and then television and then the internet, and, and now, currently, of course, my question to you is, how does a newspaper mitigate that, that impact? Boy, I know that's the holy grail we're still all looking for. Um, one of the problems is, you know, when the Internet came along, the expectation on the Internet is free or cheap, uh, fast, free, and cheap, as opposed to the newspaper business, which, again, has those high fixed costs. So, yes, the newspaper business is a media business now. It's not just the paper, and it hasn't been for a long time. Still, we haven't figured out how to migrate the dollars. And, you know, you're in that straddling period still where we're trying to do both. Now, in this market, demand for traditional print has been strong up to now. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I am too. <laughs> well, we have to support it. I mean, how else are we going to know what goes on at city council? We can't always go ourselves. That would be sort of inefficient, wouldn't it? And I'm always interested in what's in the paper, the local news. And that's the franchise. But again, it costs money. Good, good content, quality journalism costs money. So we still haven't quite figured out what the model is going to be done. I will say this, though. I, I do think the political climate that we're in now has led to a resurgence in journalism. There's some great journalism going on, especially by The Post and The New York Times. And it kind of reminds me of the Watergate era, which I'm old enough to remember pretty fondly when a lot of people committed to journalism then. So I like to think it's not about the platform, that good journalism will survive, but we're not quite sure how the money is going to work out. Some people feel like it's going to be smaller, 
maybe more selective, but we have to pull for it because it's, it's just unimaginable not to have good journalism. And no one else can do what the newspapers do, especially locally. TV does do some um, journalism, as you know, but it tends to be 30 minutes in a broadcast um, and not as deep. We've always depended on print journalism for the depth. So I'm hoping the resurgence will carry us till we can figure, till we can figure it out. Yes. How much of your revenue is generated by ads, and are the are the ads under like the contracts? And if so, mm. how long is the average contract? That's a really good question. Well, uh, the old adage is still true that what you pay to buy the paper, you know, on the street or through your subscription, only covers the paper and the ink it takes to produce it. Everything else is covered by the advertiser. That's why I always said, you know, yes, you've got to have a, a great editor, you've got to have great people in all the top jobs when you're a publisher, but if you don't have a good ad director, I mean, you're not going to be a very good publisher. And so that's why that's so important because you have to have the money to fund the newsroom and the mission. And all the other departments are really there to support the news. The news, that's what you have to sell. So it's a, uh, for example, circulation, the circulation department when I was still publisher, um, their revenues were somewhere in the $12 million for actually selling the paper and the digital products too, of course, way into that. The one majors list when I moved over to the ad department to be, to be the uh, ad director, one list had that much revenue on it. One person had that much responsible for the whole department. So, you know, it's, it's uh, largely the ad budget, it's three quarters of the revenue, give or take. Now, you know, it may change as the numbers start to change, but that's why the revenue is so important. And that's why I say businesses have to have a way to have a healthy revenue stream to survive. They can cut costs to a degree. And you know, we needed to cut some costs. I did some cost cutting myself back in the days. But uh, you can't just cut the cost. You've got to figure out the revenue conundrum. And that's where, right now, um, the media, all the media are struggling. Good questions, very thoughtful questions. Anybody else? Yes? You were looking at the way you were able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Oh, you know, a couple of other things right off the bat. And I, this sort of goes without saying, but you really want to look sharp. You know, this is not the day to be your most casual. <laughs> and look sharp. You can still look like yourself, but um, be well-groomed, dress a little nicer than you think you may need to. You know, just like I wouldn't have come over here today and what I had on yesterday, uh, which was kind of schlumpy. <laughs> You know, I was playing tennis last night. I wouldn't come over here wearing that. Um, you, you need to dress for the job you want and dress a little better. That's a first impression. And then, again, put some preparation into it. Um, you can do all kinds of research now online. You can even find out what the person or people look like who you'll be talking to. And you certainly should know their titles, and who they are. Um, be prepared with some questions. Um, you may not get them all asked, but you might, and you certainly don't want to run out of them. And it's okay to have a few notes. I never minded when people referred to some notes um, and had done their homework and read a little bit about the company. They're not going to expect you to know everything about them, of course, but they're going to want to see some curiosity. Here's another little informal tip and uh, another little story. Um, once I was hiring an executive to run one of our departments, it was to run the circulation department. And uh, a young man came in to interview for it. We were very high on him based on the um, interviews we'd done on phone, on video. Nowadays, if you're hiring from outside the region, you do those first. You don't fly people in and bear all that cost when it might not be worth it. So we were very high on him coming in. And he was one of three finalists. And he came in first. And he came in on um, a Saturday afternoon, and he was at Hotel Roanoke. And when I met him for dinner that night, I knew when he was coming in. And um, he had gotten himself to the Hotel Roanoke on the shuttle. And when I met him for dinner, I said, well, so 
uh, tell me, what time did you get in? Oh, I got in around 11 a.m. I was coming in from Wisconsin. And I said, oh, and what did you do? What did you do? How'd you spend the afternoon? He said, oh, I didn't do much of anything except hole up and watch sports in the room. And I said, oh, have you seen anything of the town? No, he really hadn't. And I mean, this was a job that was going to have him out in the community. Now, I was listening for something specific. When we would bring people into Roanoke, I was always listening for them to tell me how interesting they found this place. Most people from outside Roanoke haven't been to Roanoke before. You wouldn't believe how many people say, it's my first time in Roanoke, I didn't know this was here, but gosh, it's just a little gem, you know? That's what I wanted to hear him say, not, there's not much here, or didn't look like much. I said, did you walk down on the city market? You know, it was time of year when it would have been lively down there. No, didn't look like there was that much going on. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is bad. He was kind of viewing this as a vacation, you know? So you really want to be prepared for, if I'm asked this, what will I say? You know, not totally scripted, but have some ideas and think about that. Um, I also, I was giving somebody uh, career advice not too long ago, a uh, daughter of a friend, and her situation, she's in nursing, and so she has lots of options, very, very marketable. You know, that's a great career because they're always in demand, and they make very good money. And I said, she had three different She's interviewing with three different situations, all very different. One, a small clinic, one at a nonprofit, one at a big hospital, one at a university. And I said, why don't you make a little spreadsheet? And here's how I would start it. And have columns for each one because the salary, the benefits, the working conditions are all very different. That might help you sort out you know, where you're going with it. So once you're in that process, you have to really give some thought, not just to what it, this job looks great, it's good. Hey, it looks kind of easy. Nothing that's really great comes that easily, you know. Take, take the harder job while you're on the way up. It'll teach you more. And, you know, you don't need to be worried about how soft it can be. You really want it tough so you can learn, you know, where they're going to teach you the most. Uh, that's what my old professor told me. He said, I was at this small newspaper. Uh, I was the big fish in the small pond. Gosh, we only had six reporters. It didn't, wasn't that hard to be in the top. 10% or something. And I said, yeah, I got it pretty good here. You know, my parents let me live in their basement, got built-in babysitting for my kid, and pretty good, you know, won a couple of awards. You know, I thought, oh, that's, that's okay. He said, oh, you're stagnating. You need to get out of here. If you stay too long, they'll start to think, this is all you can do. I said, well, where should I go? He said, you need to go where they're going to teach you something, where they're going to push you a lot harder. And trust me, that's where I ended up. And they really did push me. So someplace that's going to push you and propel you. Listen for that. Training, opportunities, our business is expanding, we're hiring. Those are all really good signs. It doesn't mean it can't change. And unfortunately, sometimes people aren't breathtakingly honest when they are in recruit mode. They are selling. But listen with your eyes and ears and... Uh, your preparation. The, the good news is, you know, it feels like it's all weighted toward the company and against you, and you really need the job, right? But actually, companies are always looking for good people. The pressure's always there, too. We're trying to find good people to hire and work for us, and uh, we want that. So we're just looking to see that spark in you, and you'll, and you'll have it, I know. So you've already got the good grooming, you know, part, and that eager look, see? That's right. That's right. Some people can, you know, some people look really neat in a pair of jeans and a blazer, and, and other people just kind of look a little like an unmade bed when they come in. And you just want to check your look in the mirror, you know, before you go, because that, that first impression, sometimes that's all people give you is five minutes, you know, and you want, so you want to really be sharp and be ready, get there a little early. Uh, how many people would come interview at the newspaper, which is downtown? They'd go, oh, it's downtown. I, I couldn't figure out one-way street or how to park. <laughs> that does not bode well. You want that to really be not even mentioned. You know, allow an extra 20 minutes. <laughs> and if you have to wait, chill your heels in the lobby, so be it. Don't mention that either. You know, that's good. That's just time to sit there and gather, gather yourself up. Any other questions or thoughts? 
Well, if not, thank you once again for your great attention. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure being here. If I can ever help you, let me know. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. For those of you that are my students, don't forget, I want to hear your responses. So you can turn that in to me. I have